you think consciousness is a thing or do you think it's just the reaction to a subconscious process? So X, Y, Z happened. And so I was thirsty. I reached for the cup. Oh, I'm thirsty. I should reach for the cup. Oh, shoot. I already started reaching for the cup. There's been a lot of experiments like that showing that people's perception or people's decision to do something happens after they've started doing it. That's right. But so the, the data are very, very clear in, in carefully controlled experiments where you have a person make a simple decision, like press the button on the left versus the button on the right. And just, you know, whenever you want to make a choice about which button you're going to press and, and then keep track of this clock. There's a hand on a clock moving around. Whenever you feel that you've made your choice, just remember where the hand on the clock was pointing, what number, so we can know when you felt like you made the conscious choice. And you do these experiments repeatedly, and what you find is, by measuring EEG or other forms of brain activity, the experimenter can predict up to seven seconds ahead of time what the person's choice is going to be, seven seconds before they say that they were conscious of the choice that they were going to make, that they, that they had now made the choice. Seven seconds. Now, the standard interpretation of those data are that brain processes that are unconscious, um, in the sense that there's just no consciousness at all associated with them, um, are the real causal engine here. They're the real thing that's doing the work and they make the decision and your conscious experience in some sense is a latecomer. It only, it only gets informed later on a few seconds later about what the, the hardware of the brain had decided. And, and then the consciousness then sort of uh, takes the credit for it and says, I made that decision when in fact it's just, uh, you know, along for the ride. That's the standard theory. Uh, I disagree with that theory from start to finish. Um, although the, the experimental data are absolutely as, as, as I described. So the brain activity is clearly allows prediction ahead of time. So it's going to require a, a very, very novel framework to account for those data um, and, and to escape the idea that unconscious brain processes cause our conscious our, our choices. So, so the framework that I'm working on, and, and, and this takes, a minute because I'm going to now be challenging assumptions that we deeply hold. Go for it. So, yeah. So one assumption that we deeply hold is that we see reality as it is. If I see an apple, I'm not seeing all of the truth, but I am seeing truly that there is an object with that shape and that color and that distance from me. And <clears throat> If I see the moon, I'm not making up the moon. I'm seeing uh, a big chunk of rock that would exist even if I weren't looking. So we believe that our senses tell us truths about a real space-time reality that has real physical objects in it. And the reason that most of my colleagues give from science for believing that is an argument from evolution. <clears throat> that basically those of our, that, that seeing reality accurately makes you more fit. If you have two, two organisms, one that sees reality as it is, at least to a good degree, and another one that doesn't, then clearly the argument goes, the organism that sees reality more accurately will be more fit and more likely to survive and pass on its genes. And of course, you don't need to see all of reality, just the aspects of reality that uh, you need to stay alive. <clears throat> so I don't need to see neutrinos and pi mesons and all that stuff, but I do need to see apples and the moon and mountains and so forth. And so I see the aspects of the truth that I need to see. And so working with some colleagues, I've first questioned that assumption. Does evolution by natural selection really favor organisms 
but see reality as it is? And the answer is absolutely not. That organisms that see reality as it is are never more fit than organisms of equal complexity that see none of reality and just focus, their, their senses just focus on what are called fitness payoffs. Um, and that's a stunning result. Um, but it's, it's a mathematical result that follows from evolutionary game theory. So, so evolution by natural selection is a mathematically precise theory now. We have the tools of evolutionary game theory that were introduced in the 1970s by a, a mathematician named John Maynard Smith. And using the replicator equation and, and the whole framework of evolutionary game theory, we can actually prove that um, the probability is zero um, that an organism that sees reality as it is will be more fit than an organism of equal complexity that sees none of reality. And is just their, their senses just report fitness payoffs. And the idea of fitness payoffs, I mean, is important. Think, you can think of evolution by natural selection like a video game. If you're playing a video game, um, you, you, know, you have to focus on getting points as fast as you can. And if you get enough points in a short enough time, you might get to the next level. Otherwise, you die and you have to start over. And if you do anything but focus on getting those points while you're playing the video game, good luck, you're probably going to die. So you really have to focus uh, on getting those points. Evolution by natural selection is very much the same way. It's, it's like a game you're collecting fitness payoffs. And if you get more fitness payoffs than your competition, then the equations of natural selection say that you have a much better chance of passing on your genes, which code for your strategy for collecting those fitness payoffs. Fitness payoffs are things like, you know, getting food that you need to stay alive, avoiding predators and finding um, good mates. So these are the kinds of things that, that offer fitness payoffs.